Hello and welcome back to Multidimensional Integration, the video series where we talk a lot about integration in Rn. In particular, we learn how to explicitly solve integrals and in today's part 6, we will look at an example for the change of variables formula. Indeed, we will apply the substitution rule to a two-dimensional integral. However, as always, before we start with the calculation, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. I am really grateful because your support makes it possible that I can create such videos about mathematics. And as you might already know, as a supporter you can access a lot of additional material with the link in the description. And with that, let's immediately start by recalling the change of variables formula like we have discussed it in the last video. Here we have it and the quick explanation would be that a variable x in an n-dimensional integral can be substituted by a diffeomorphism phi. And then the important factor that comes into the integral is the absolute value of the determinant of the Jacobian of phi. And as you can see, this formula has two directions. Depending which integral is easier to solve, it's the integral we want to get. And how this exactly works in practice, I can immediately show you with an example. And there the best application would be a two-dimensional example, because it's still complicated enough, but we can sketch it. Hence what we get here is just an integral with two variables. And here we have the cosine function, where I put in x minus y divided by x plus y. And we integrate this function over the domain g, which I will explain soon. But first you should note that the x here does not play the role like the x before, because here x is only a one-dimensional variable. And moreover, you should also see that we are actually working on the right-hand side already, because we immediately see this phi function inside the cosine function. But before we do this whole substitution, let's first talk about this region G. Obviously it should be a subset in R2, so we consider x and y as a vector in R2. And now for this example, we just have a lot of inequalities. The first one is that 1 half minus x is always less or equal than 1 half. And then we also have that 1 half is less or equal than x plus y. And moreover, x plus y should also be less or equal than 1. And moreover, we also have that 1 is less or equal than 1 plus y. And that's it. This is the whole definition of our region G in R2. And now I recommend that the first thing you should do is to sketch this whole domain G. And indeed, there it's helpful to write all the inequalities separately. And there the easiest ones are the one on the left and the one on the right hand side. They look complicated but they are actually quite simple because we can pull this one half to the other side. And then we see that this inequality just means that x is greater or equal than zero. And the same thing we can do with the second inequality and there we see that y has to be greater or equal than zero. This is a nice result because it implies that everything happens in the first quadrant of the xy plane. This means we only have to consider x and y values that are non-negative. Okay, and now we can also consider the two middle inequalities as well. So there we have 1 half is less or equal than x plus y and x plus y is less or equal than 1. And there it's really helpful to bring y to one side because then we get a functional relation. For example, the first one here means that y is always greater than 1 half minus x. So this is not complicated at all because it just describes a linear function that starts at 1 half here at the y-axis. And then it goes linearly to 1 half on the x-axis and now we know we lie above it, so we cannot lie inside this triangle here. On the other hand, the fourth inequality here also gives us a nice linear relation. There we have that y is always less or equal than 1 minus x. This means this also gives us a linear graph here on the right hand side. This one goes from 1 to 1, but now the inequality tells us that we have to lie below it. So putting both things together tells us that we have to lie in between both lines. And there we have it, this is how our region G looks like, 
This is our domain of integration for the integral. However, as we have already figured out, this g here is actually the utility in the formula for the change of variables. This means after defining phi, we also have to calculate the image of g under this new map phi. Therefore, the next step is first to define our C1 diffeomorphism phi. This means phi just goes from R2 into R2 again. And we already know, if we call the input x and y, then the output should fit with the composition we have in the integral, so the best thing would be to have x minus y and x plus y. Hence the first component we can choose as x minus y and the second one as x plus y. So this map goes nicely from R2 into R2 and we also see it's invertible, differentiable and the inverse is also differentiable. Indeed the map is so simple that we don't have any problems at all. Moreover, we can also immediately write down the Jacobian such that our change of variables formula is complete. So to get the Jacobian at the point xy, we just have to calculate partial derivatives. And there the partial derivative with respect to x give us 1 and 1. And with respect to y, we get minus 1 and plus 1. So you see, it's really simple to calculate the determinant of this Jacobian. Indeed, it has the same value at every point, and this one is 2. So it's not a problem at all to add this factor to our original integral. And with that, we can immediately apply our change of variables formula. So again, what we do, we add a factor of 1 half in front of the integral to get the factor 2 inside. Which means now we actually have the right hand side for our change of variables formula. And there you know we have a function f composed with the diffeomorphism phi. And in our case here the variables are called x and y. And moreover we also have to multiply this by the absolute value of the determinant of the Jacobian. And indeed in our case this is just the factor 2. However the function f we use here we definitely should explain because it's a function with two inputs. And indeed these new inputs we can call as we want and maybe u and v is appropriate. Again the name is not so important but clearly it should be different from x and y. And now by the definition of the diffeomorphism phi we have u divided by v inside the cosine function. In fact this is exactly what the substitution with two variables does. We substituted the numerator and the denominator. In other words, now we can apply the change of variables formula and then we integrate with respect to the new variables. So what we get is 1 half times the integral of f. This is all what happens in the change of variables formula, so we just have to solve the integral for the cosine function. So let's immediately do that. Instead of f, we write cosine of u divided by v. However, we should also not forget that the domain of integration is now the image of g under phi. So the question is, what happens to our nice area given by g when we apply our diffeomorphism phi? This is really important, this is actually what we need to know to solve the integral. And now obviously the best thing would be to describe this new domain by using the variables u and v. Again it does not matter how we call the variables, but now we know that phi transforms the xy variables to uv variables. Indeed if you look at the image of phi we see that u is given by x minus y and v is given by x plus y. So this is something we can put into a box in order to remember it. And on the other hand we also have to recall the definition of g because now we have to translate all the inequalities to the new variables u and v. For example, the middle one here is quite simple because it tells us that v lies between 1 half and 1. So this one we can just write down. So we have v inside the interval 1 half to 1. And for the other inequalities, it might be helpful to invert the relation we get by our diffeomorphism phi. In this case, it's quite simple because we immediately get that u plus v is equal to 2x. And in the same way we can also calculate v minus u and we get 2y. And now these two equalities we can use for the inequalities from above. 
Indeed, what we had was that x is non-negative and y is non-negative. So the factor 2 is not important and we can immediately write that u plus v has to be greater or equal than 0 and the same for v minus u. Hence, if we want, we can also bring v to one side and then we have two inequalities that we can interpret as a functional relation. So v is greater or equal than minus u and v is greater or equal than plus u. Okay, so this is the image of g and now we can sketch it in the uv plane. And there we already know that for v we only need the positive values. Indeed, we know even more because everything has to lie in the strip between one half and one. And in addition to that, we can also put our two linear functions into the sketch. Hence, here on the left hand side, we find the function minus u. And completely symmetric to that, we also have the function v is equal to plus u. And since the condition is that we lie above both functions, we know that our region lies in this part. So the whole thing does not look so complicated and this will help in solving the integral. Now to recap, this is our original domain g and this one got transformed by the diffeomorphism phi. You see that not much happened because it just got rotated, but this helps already a lot because our variable v lies in a complete interval now. And as you might already know from former videos, exactly this allows us to apply Frobenius theorem. So you see, now we are finally in the last step of our whole calculation. We applied the change of variables formula and got the following result. And there the domain of integration phi of g allows us to split the integral up into two one-dimensional integrals. This is exactly what we know as Frobenius theorem and also the order is already fixed. Namely, the outer integral has to be the one with respect to v. Simply because if we fix such a v, then u is already given as a function of v. Indeed, the sketch above already explains it completely. And moreover, we also have it in the formula u goes from minus v to plus v. Hence, this is exactly what we have to put to the limits of the integral. And there you see, we can easily solve the inner integral because we just need an antiderivative of the cosine function. And there you know, this is not complicated at all because it's given by the sine function. This means we have the sine of u divided by v and if we form the derivative with respect to u, we also get a factor out. And this factor has to cancel, so we have to multiply with v. And that's it, this is the whole antiderivative and now we know we have to evaluate it at v and minus v. So more precisely, it means for u we put in v and minus v. And the result we get there, we can put to the right hand side. So first inside the integral, we have our function v. And then times sine of one minus sine of minus one. And also don't forget, this is the integral with respect to v. So not a complicated integral at all, because the sine functions are just constants. And moreover, since sine is an odd function, we also know that this part here is plus sine of 1 again. In other words, we just have sine of 1 two times. Therefore, we can just pull out this constant and just integrate our linear function v. So now the constant is just 2 times sine of 1. And the antiderivative of the linear function is 1 half v squared. And most importantly, also don't forget the limits we have, namely 1 and 1 half. Hence what we have here is simply 1 half minus 1 eighth. So in total we just have 3 eighths times the constant in front, which is just sine of 1. And there we have it, this is our result, 3 eighths times sine of 1 is exactly our integral from before. So this ends our example calculation for the change of variables formula. So I really hope that this helped a little bit and that we meet again in the next video. So have a nice day and bye bye.